Good evening, one and all present here, and welcome to Xavier's Center of Historical Research. Today we have the pre-book launch review on the Genesis Goa and the Arts, edited by Father Ryan D'Souza and Father Anthony Da Silva, and photography by David D'Souza. This book review will be done by our speaker for today, Dr. Kelly Wood. Uh, thank you for coming. Dr. Kelly Wood uh, is from Dale G. Fever, Assistant Professor of Art History from the University of Tennessee and also a Fulbright Scholar to India. So she will be doing our book review for today. I now call upon the Director of Xavier Center, Father Tony, to speak about Dr. Kelly Wood. Good evening to all of you and very welcome to this session. Particularly want to welcome once again Dr. Kelly Wood. She's been very kind to set aside some time. As you may have noticed from the newspapers, she's a very busy woman since she's come to Goa. She's in demand and she moves from place to place, holding workshops, seminars and so on. But I'm thankful that she said to me, no, I'd like to come here and spend some time and share some ideas. She's using our book as a base this evening. It's a kind of a review before we release it formally on Saturday, the 21st of October. But before that, we are getting we are blessed to have a review by a specialist. She is Professor Kelly, Kelly Moon is a is a professor of art history. It's not in a rare species in the world. So she's a professor of art history. And so she has insights which perhaps escape you and me. And so she will highlight some of these. She told me she's going to be very brief because she finds that each one of us has to discover the richness in the content of the book. She will just give some leads for us to carry home and to reflect. And also, this is a way of us saying you should pick up a copy of the book and carry it home, so that when you go through it, you can tally what she's saying with the pictures in the book. So, once again, very welcome, Professor Wood, and we're very happy that you're with us. Although the time is very short, still you will manage to make it here. After Professor Kelly uh, does her presentation, we will have a few minutes, because she has to rush back home, we have a few minutes of questions and answers, so you can raise some questions, she'll be happy to answer them, and then uh, we will break up for the evening. But thanks once again for coming. Please give her a warm welcome. Uh, we close. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind and overly generous introduction and for having me here today to review what will inevitably become a standard work in the study of Goan art and Jesuit art in South Asia. Um, so thank you so much to Malcolm, to uh, Father Anthony, um, and to uh, Ronaldo D'Souza. Uh, who also edited the book, and to uh, David D'Souza, who did the photography, for giving me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts uh, today. Um, I, as a Fulbright scholar, which is a scholar of international exchange, it has been incredible as an American to be so welcomed into this intellectual and artistic community. And one of the real uh, assets this book will bring uh, to not just Goa or India, but Europe and the world, I'm sure, is knowledge about artworks, objects, and histories that have frequently been effaced, ignored, and certainly for me as an art historian, have not been part of a standard curriculum of either history or art. So I'm excited about this book. Um, the scholars, curators, and thinkers um, have included rich archival sources, 
rich visual sources, and also keen analysis in each chapter. Um, so I thought I'd actually um, begin with how the book ends with Robert de Silva, because um, he speaks of interiority, mindfulness, and empathy as we approach Jesuit works of art in Goa and the world beyond. And to me, uh, this reminds us that these are not simply cultural artifacts, but for many are also religious artifacts. My, my husband is Catholic and was brought up <laughs> and, uh, in, in, in a Jesuit education. So it reminds me of this quote um, of the spiritual exercises of uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola. To give us true acquaintance and knowledge that we may interiorly feel that it is not ours or to keep great devotion, intense love, tears, or any other spiritual consolation, but it is all the gift and grace of God our Lord. And that we not, may not build a nest in a thing and not ours, raising our intellect, our intellect, not through pride or glory, but by attributing to us a devotion or the things of the spiritual consolation. And so his discussion of the way that artworks like the descent from the cross can remind us of um, our relationship to contemporary conceptions of psychology and interiority uh, struck me. Um, also, his PhD is from the University of Michigan, uh, where I was a professor for three years. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a bit of a connection there. Um, so I wanted to start with that because uh, my next uh, thought is about the ethics of history itself. And I bring up uh, Deepesh Chakrabarti because part of this entire project of Jesuit art in places like Goa is about provincializing Europe. That is to say, to decenter Europe as uh, the locus of where art and religion is centered during the time period that I study, which is the Italian Renaissance and the Baroque. And so it reminds me of uh, this quote he has, that even the very idea of doing this kind of history, or art history, um, can carry with it some European assumptions about disenchanted space, secular time, secular time, and sovereignty that may not well be mapped on to uh, new methods and new approaches to looking at religious art and architecture from the past, not simply as residues of events and things that have happened, but rather as opportunities to evaluate our own human um, uh, ethics, spirituality, and interiority. So I end with uh, this quote from one of my favorite philosophers, Tim Scanlon, um, what do we owe each other? and thinking about that as we approach scholarship, art, history, and life. So, um, I'm gonna move on to uh, a little bit of a story, perhaps, to get us uh, started uh, on our journey. So, can everyone hear me at a good level? Um, yes, okay, I'm just making sure. <laughs> because sometimes that's um, So, in the 17th century, Daniele Bartoli, on the history of the Society of Jews in Asia, recounted a miracle performed by St. Francis and Xavier. When Xavier was en route from Malacca to China, the merchant ship upon which he was traveling exhausted its water and supplies, imperiling the 500 passengers on the ship. Upon Xavier's miraculous transformation of the 
brine of ocean water into potable drinking water, the passengers then declared faith in the one true Christian God. Now this painting from Lisbon focuses on the coalition of conversion and capital, that is capitalism. The passengers and crew of this merchant ship offer Xavier's blessings to the creasing waves of a rough sea. Well, as the ship's stern, we can see that the Portuguese flag flies over a niche of the Virgin Mary. Xavier's miracle is thus imagined as an actual uh, safeguard over a company's investment into their enterprise and merchant trade. We see trade winds billow in their ship sails to repel cargo and crew to port and prosperity under the auspices of divine protection. Bartoli would later account how the saint's arm miraculously protected the ship and crew during the perilous voyage from assault by pirates who were enemies on account of their difference of both religion, they were Protestants, and serenity, they were Dutch. When their vessel came under attack, the crew entreated um, uh, Gonzalez to employ the power of Xavier's relic to protect them, whereupon the priests lifted up the arm and chanted the saints' names. This was the voice of God, they said, um, and of the saint, and it was concluded that Xavier's arm, when it finally arrived in the in Rome without interrupting it was considered a miracle. When Xavier's uh, incorruptible body returned to his home of Goa, his saintly presence was regarded as another holy safeguard. And one Portuguese woman even bit off his big toe, which is now displayed in a reliquary here in the chapel of San Antonio, which is what you are seeing uh, on the left there. So all this is to say is that the sacred did not travel, transfer, or translate easily in early modernity. The rite of translation in Latin translatio literally meant the relocation of a sacred relic, such as those of Xavier's. So consecration relied upon a communal agreement upon the locus for that which was deemed holy. Consequently, the words, images, and objects and bodies that conveyed and engendered the sacred uh, could cause friction as their meaning shifted through movement between people and place and across space and time. Who and what as in the case of the corporeal remains of St. Xavier's relics, was able to proffer the voice of God, and how and in what form the shape it should be expressed, um, guided much artistic patronage. Because, as we know, as the Jesuits spread across the wall, they found themselves with often an incommensurability of faith, whether it was the uh, Mexico in the Americas, or the Hindu in South Asia. So these intersecting modes of faith produced a difference. So the translation of scripture into new languages, um, this had already uh, concerned Catholic um, from St. Jerome's edition of the public Bible, of the Vulgate Bible. So this brings us to our first chapter of this wonderful volume written by Renal de Souza, um, who is a specialist um, and uh, currently earning his PhD in history in, in Belgium um, and has already done an incredible amount of work and published things like the public history of Goa in 2019. Um, and uh, much in the same way that saints' relics and icons conveyed the sacred through their location and physical form, 
Catholic doctrine was imparted by a very precise text that carried with it, um, it's in its very textual form of Latin, the language and weighty aura of that which was holy. That meant that the translation of religious works from one language into another prompted concerns over veracity, concerns based on the seriousness that um, if someone was trying to convert, if something was mistranslated, it could lead um, to things like heresy. Missionaries in particular faced the challenge of accurately teaching the core texts. Um, they eventually and uh, ultimately decided uh, that the risks were outweighed by the benefits, and the 16th century witnessed the establishment of translations and printing presses throughout the reach of Christendom. And um, um, his essay uh, reminds us uh, of the translations and contributions of the Jesuit accommodatio or accommodation in the form of the Peso Grama by Thomas Stevens, which has often been gone on notice. Um, so uh, we also have seen uh, this, um, so the, the accommodatio has the desire to not oppress the population's uh, uh, native or indigenous religion, but rather to accommodate them and to bring them into the fold together through Jesuit Christianity. We've seen this in many other places. Um, uh, in Mexico City in 1539, there was a printing press set up. Um, here in Goa, at the call of St. Paul in 1556, and in Lima in South America in 1584, Antonio Ricardo set up a printing press and workshop. So these presses produced multilingual works and translations of instructional church doctrine in indigenous languages. Um, uh, in indigenous languages, including things like multiple dictionaries and what you're seeing, um, things like Tamil translations of Xavier's Doctor Christian and the Catechism in different languages. Um, so what you're seeing here is after a printing license was granted in the Philippines in 1593, Chinese artists working there helped produce the catechism in the Babayan script, script of the Tagalog at a monastery outside Manila. Um, so these are these important ways in which this accommodatio is uh, being achieved through this global expansion of evangelism. Thinking about the visual arts, we can look at works like uh, those of Jose Lopez de uh, Jose Lopez de los Rios, uh, a Bolivian painter known as the Master of the Calamarca. And he produced images of armed angels wielding arquebuses, which spoke to local concerns over the necessary protection of confessors and the newly converted alike. This angel is garbed in local Inca finery, so the clothing is South American. And there are also aspects of European clothes, outfitted with a Spanish firearm, plumed with the divine wings. It was legible, not only within Catholicism, but also Andean beliefs and Incan mythology. So this angel was intended to inspire the fear of God for devotees in a hybrid colonial environment through a test and attempt towards um, uh, um, uh, accommodatio. Is there any way to, to turn off these lights <laughs> so you can better see these beautiful images? <laughs> because I can see fine on my... Uh, on my iPad screen. Because I think this image in particular is really, is really special to look at. Yeah. 
wonderful. Um, and so you can really see this plumage, this gun, and um, it's this kind of confluence of, of, of imagery and iconography that would have appealed to people um, who were meeting different belief systems in the middle as uh, they worked towards this Jesuit form of accommodation through visual works of art. Now, um, moving on to the next chapter, um, uh, Delia Mendoza, uh, who also has uh, PhDs, uh, history degrees from Kuhn and Goa, um, and uh, has served as the director of the Xavier Center and taught Portuguese literature with numerous uh, books, um, has reminded us of uh, a different direction uh, that the Jesuits took. Um, of both the importance of this global missionary work and its centrality to the mission of the Jesuit order, but also the um, exceptionality, reputation, and influence on local population that was necessary for evangelism and conversion. Well before the papal institution of the Propaganda of Fide in 1622, the expansion of Catholicism from across the globe, Jesuits became a compelling force, and Ignatius Loyola did in particular, despite that his approaches were somewhat different than St. Francis Xavier's, as Delio Mendoza reminds us in his essay. So one image he's chosen is the vision of St. Ignatius when, in November of 1537, Ignatius Loyola was traveling outside Rome, and when the group passed by a small church, uh, La Storta, to pray, it was there that Ignatius had this vision of God, the Father in Christ, holding the cross and urging him on. The words of Jesus Christ refer to the fact that St. Ignatius was seeking papal permission to establish the Society of Jesus. And just as the vision of the saint anticipated, in 1540, Pope Paul III recognized this new religious order that had great importance during the colonial period. So while we have these images, um, and this we see the vision of La Storta, this kind of uh, small uh, place outside of Rome, uh, urging uh, the foundation of the Jesuit order, what we see, um, you know, of the Church of the Jesu is that um, that there was very much still um, a European presence um, to the kind of missionary work that these um, that these uh, um, that these evangelists undertook. Now. Uh, the Jesuit Modo Guarano by Cristina Oswaldo, for me, um, as a Portuguese historian of art and material culture, uh, was uh, just a delight for me to read. Um, she got her PhD at the EUI in Florence, where I have actually spent a lot of time. And um, uh, a, a key and central aspect of the work that she presents is thinking about art in Goa, not as simply a hybrid of Indo-Portuguese, um, not as uh, only Italian, uh, Portuguese, Dutch, or French, but rather a modo goa, to think of the Goan style as being definable in its own, despite, not despite of, but because of the integration of various different sources and types of um, art uh, that were brought together. And one image that I show you here is the pulpit, which in Catholic architecture is where preaching would be done from, but iconographically it uses the serpent Naga figure from ancient um, Hinduism in 
the Church of St. Anne of Tala, you mean um, as the support system for this pulpit. So we see another way in which Hindu iconography uh, is coming together with Catholic uh, architecture um, in this process of Jesuit accommodation as we move through. Another aspect of this work uh, that she considers is uh, something like the silver casket that was designed by the Italian Jesuit uh, Marcello Mastrilli in the 17th century. Uh, but we know, in fact, that he absolutely had assistance from Gowen Goldsmiths. Uh, we think of uh, the term gold and go, uh, and actually a lot of work that we call gold is silver really means metalwork at a high expensive level. And we can see uh, through the scenes of the life of St. Francis Xavier, um, uh, the incredible craftsmanship and skill that was not possible simply by this named European artist that was put in charge of the product. Uh, but rather, we should remind ourselves of the long-standing local population's um, renown and excellence in things like metalwork as, uh, as being central to understanding uh, art and architecture of Jesuit Goa. So too, in the next chapter, Forgotten Altarpieces in Goan Churches, uh, Monica Estevez Reed has uh, done an incredible um, amount of uh, collaboration and field work to really document the very many things that we have and can see that have still gone um, unaddressed. She notes that even with among us who study Goan art and architecture, there's been an overemphasis, perhaps out of ease, on um, sites in Goa Vela, right? Um, and that we need to find a way to address kind of post-colonial notion of shared heritage. Um, and think uh, very much, uh, 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 think very much like um, uh, Christina Oswald uh, about the kind of um, pluralistic or multifaceted uh, layers of artistic production in terms of style, in terms of workmanship, and in terms of contribution uh, that we can um, see. So here are some of these detailed photographs. Uh, we can see the um, uh, ovoid, uh, we can see the double columns, um, the polychrome of this golden goa, these pedicles with the acanthus leaves, but also a style of figures of angels that um, takes on a, um, uh, a very particular uh, stylistic characteristic that can be well appreciated. And, and this monument was only restored in 2022. So another issue brought to bear is um, how we fund cultural initiatives and who funds cultural initiatives and which ones get funded and which ones get ignored. I myself began as a scholar of the Italian Renaissance. And what I will say is that um, uh, folks in Rome and Florence and the North um, are, are quite thrilled with the money that is thrown at them to restore Michelangelo whereas scholars in Naples and Palermo lament uh, that it seems like their region of the country has not received the same funding for restoration of equally important local and regional works. Um, so part of what um, uh, Monica's contribution is here uh, is a, a reminder that we have to avoid kind of orientalist value judgments that are all too common in the history of art, not only in our analysis, but also uh, in the way that we have um, uh, funded them. Um, and she has done this on um, an astounding number of uh, international uh, projects, um, especially studying uh, altarpieces um, uh, across 
not just go up, but um, also uh, do and other places. So uh, thinking about these altar pieces um, across uh, forgotten places. Now finally, we have understanding Goa's Christian art through the Jesuit collection of Mocha. And I was very fortunate to meet uh, the curator, uh, Natasha Fernandez, during my very first visit here. And she was kind enough to uh, give me a tour of the collection. And it happened to coincide with one of the very brief uh, times that the nuns of the convent of Santa Monica were on a uh, study trip. So we were able to tour uh, the, the convent. Um, and the work that she is doing uh, with collaborators like Noah Fernandez to both um, document, study, but also preserve and display um, the Jesuit collection at the Museum of Christian Art um, has been uh, incredible and central. And I remember being uh, devastated that the pandemic uh, delayed my, my first visit on seeing uh, the collection because the first time that I, I came it had not yet reopened because as many of you know it has been a long process um, based on history of theft and, uh, and difficulties so the work that they've undertaken um, is incredible. I highlight here some of the artworks that are from the time period that I study um, which are religious artworks made in metal so we have a chalice um, from the Say Cathedral in the late 16th century. And um, you can see the ornate um, kind of horror vacui, this idea and ideal to cover every surface uh, with decoration um, and with, with winged angels across um, it. We also have um, an incense boat uh, on the other side, which uh, has images of St. Francis Xavier. And of course, this would have made so much sense and iconographically resonated uh, with um, the uh, Portuguese uh, and Dutch uh, um, uh, visitors, converts, and uh, new settlers in Goa. Who, uh, who traveled by ship or who intended to remain in Goa and whose merchandise and livelihood uh, was based on ships. This is also in addition to, of course, uh, St. Francis Xavier's uh, miraculous uh, incorruptible body and its safe return to Goa where it still remains today. Um, so, one of the most important contributions to this book and this artistic project is in fact through uh, this large scale of the book and the incredible nature of the photography. And so we see here at the bottom, this is on the, um, this is on the cover of the book, uh, this uh, serpent surrounding the infant Christ in the world, um, typical Baroque seashell patterns, um, and the fine craftsmanship, um, and on my screen it's actually uh, better than projected up here. So these images and this incredible photography that was made possible by David D'Souza, who actually a lot of his work uh, focuses on anti-fashion photography um, and, and other kinds of projects. Uh, the availability of these images to scholars who may not have the time to, to come to Goa or who come to the Museum of Christian Art and, like me, look through the beautiful glass vitrines that Natasha has installed and can't take pictures of the objects because the glass, um, uh, there's that glare, but who need to, to see these details in, in these works in order to identify is this style of metalwork typically Goan? Is it typically Gujarati? Um, or, as we're often learning, is it from artisans from other places across India who have migrated in this early period to Goa because uh, it is this craftsman's cosmopolis, this place 
where artists are valued and have an opportunity to um, show their work. So um, the photography, no, no less than the scholarship analysis and archival research, uh, will make this book uh, incredibly important and useful uh, to the community as we move forward. And um, so one of the things that uh, I'd like to conclude with is simply my work, as I think that uh, this, this volume gives art historians an opportunity to ask new questions and to uh, delve into uh, new, um, new areas. Um, so uh, in particular, I have been looking at metal art and what you're seeing on the right is actually an image of a goldsmith from Goa created in 1540 by uh, a, a, a Gujarati uh, artisan based on the style of painting, but who had migrated to Goa. And we know that by the time he uh, sent this manuscript to the College of St. Paul in Lisbon, um, that uh, Lisbon had already been filled with metalworks, precious uh, crosses, and precious religious objects made of metal uh, from Goa. We also see that this uh, has not been unvalued in its time. Uh, visitors said things like local artisans, metal workers, and jewelers are incomparably better than ours. Um, so some of the work that we're doing uh, is to go through the archives and we can name some of these metal workers. Uh, we can name some of the sculptors. We can say how much money they're making. There's work to be done here in Goa, at archives in Spain, in Lisbon, um, but also, it, and so I give you a few examples of the named metal workers that we have here working for uh, the Convent of Santa Monica and likely having worked on this Pelican Monstrance, which I'm sure most of you have seen if you've ever gone. And uh, one of my recent discoveries is that um, these uh, pelican monstrances in metal uh, are often and increasingly found in South America in the 18th century. So we're seeing a connection, not just between uh, Europe's evangelism in Asia, but connections directly between South America and South Asia in terms of iconography, visual form, and artistic skill. So this is just one of the ways. So this is the pelican in her piety, which is Christ as the female pelican feeding her Eucharistic blood to, um, to her flock, right? Um, and, and discovering these kind of connections across the globe, with very similar forms um, and talented techniques uh, uh, is something that I hope to continue to study and that I hope will encourage global research that makes not only Goa the focus, but uh, helps us better understand Jesuit art here and abroad. Uh, so thank you for this book. I'm certain it is going to become a classic uh, and thank you for giving me the time to, uh, to review it. it in because I'm seeing this low battery sign. <laughs> Is there a power outlet? Excellent. Wonderful. <laughs> um, yes, part please.
to thank you, Dr. Wu, for reviewing the book so thoroughly. She went, as you know, through all the chapters of the book and highlighted the challenges that we face and how we can take this work forward, for which I am really very thankful to you, because uh, these connections that you have made, particularly between cultures, is so important to us, South Asia and South America, for example, India and Europe, for example, and so on and so forth. Now, as I said, uh, Dr. Wood is also in a little bit of a hurry. So we will take a few questions and she will respond to them. So if you can formulate your questions specifically and precisely, it would be very helpful. There is a microphone that will go round so that you can Would uh, anybody from this side first, and then we'll move to the other side. Anybody from this side? Okay. Yes, we back to the Thank you. Uh, Hindu uh, temple architectural elements. Um, there are historians um, across the world who are seeing um, uh, these nagas uh, uh, come in church architecture. Uh, elements of, of Hindu um, uh, temple architecture still visible in many of the churches in even Villa Goa today, the Say Cathedral um, and Saint Patan, right? So. I think what is um, I think what is uh, being I think the the your question is, is 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 spot on that actually it's important to name this and to be looking particularly at the idea that um, okay uh, Albrecht Dürer was from what we now call Germany but he lived in Italy to be an artist throughout history to be an artisan was one of itineracy, it was one of travel, it was one of exchange of style, and it was one where you made your living through, uh, through being innovative, through taking interesting and some of the best things from different, different kinds of cultural styles. So to say that Goa uh, has been, um, okay, so one of, our first, uh, one of our first legal cases that we can see is that um, a goldsmith, Raoul Chalim, uh, was, uh, he went to Lisbon to work for uh, uh, King Manuel I and to make jewelry and golden artifacts for him. As a reward for this, he was made the head of the goldsmiths guild when he came back to um, uh, Goa about four years later. This came to very much to the surprise of the current head of the Goldsmiths Guild, who had been um, appointed so um, 
under Adil Shah, right? So Goa was under uh, Islamic influence uh, before Portuguese influence. Uh, and yet um, we know through agricultural production, craft production, and metalwork uh, that what we now call Hinduism, uh, that there was a great number of people um, uh, producing objects, living in their villages, and living their lives in that way. So um, the fact that Goa became one of the most important cities in the world by the, world, by the year 1600 because of its trade, because artisans with skills from artisans from uh, the Netherlands, from Italy, from Portugal, from um, Karnataka, from uh, Gujarat, from artisans from all over the world wanted to come here. Or another thing we have to unfortunately recognize, were enslaved to come here and produce these artworks in a number of styles. Um, that perhaps thinking about a modo goano as recognizing the importance of Goa as a cosmopolitan city um, that uh, held grand sway. I mean, there's not that many battles over a place of this size unless it's very important. So changing that term and thinking about um, a, a Goan style rather than uh, Indo-Portuguese or some other hybrid moniker uh, could be the best way to recognize for how long uh, this has been a special place and, and particularly a special place for artists and artisans and craftsmen. So that's a wonderful question and thank you for asking it. <laughs> Thank you so much, and um, it's nice to see another art historian. Uh, one of the things that is problematic, there's no graduate degree in art history available in the state of Goa, so perhaps this conversation can be, we do in architecture, can be uh, uh, something to open this up with. Um, I will start out by saying that I am no um, expert on uh, post-colonial theory, but uh, I did start the talk uh, with one of the works that I find most inspiring, which is Chakrabarti's Provincializing Europe, um, to try to think about different methods um, uh, and different uh, ways to get at history. Um, and some of those include valuing things like oral history on the same level as documentary history. Um, just be someone's grandmother's grandmother's grandmother or a song that is continued, or I can, or even just a visual form that's continued. Um, often, history, quote unquote, has not valued that on the same level as the kind of archival documents that we find in the Directorate of Archives. So, valuing people's uh, continued and shared sense of identity, while also remembering to try to keep this lens of you know, what's, what uh, Michael Baxendall called the period I, right? The idea that, that people thought about things and saw things a little differently in the past. Um, uh, and keeping that on parallel with the ways that, um, that people are conceptualizing art and culture, especially through these alternative modes of documentation and understanding visuality would be um, a... Uh, a first approach, but uh, I suspect you have a better. Uh, if you have if you have comments for the audience, please uh, please share with us because um, this is not. Uh, I, I'm not yet an expert in, in in that kind of theory. Thank you so much. 
and another thing is to say, um, just because we don't have the names of these artists doesn't mean they don't exist. Just because we don't have the name uh, Michelangelo does not mean that artwork is any less valuable or should be any less studied. Um, but this also comes from a person where um, my first book is on the visual and material culture of games and play. So I look at the humble playing card and soccer ball as it developed in, and chess pieces, which developed in Europe um, uh, in, in the 16th century. So I kind of, I go for the, the everyday sometimes. But that's also what brought me to this project because I was writing this chapter on how Europeans were understanding chess uh, and uh, picturing themselves playing chess. And when I look at the actual chess boards, and I, and I did a, you know, some, some you know, object-based analysis, I realized that they were all made in India. <laughs> not all, not all. Early on, there's a preference for one. Some of them are made in Venice, um, and some of them it's hard to tell whether they are made in Spain or Lisbon with materials that are brought over with styles that are imitating um, other things. So I think that's another way, uh, I think that would be an, another way to get at it. Um, if, if styles are being imitated purposively to look like they're from other places and other lands, how can that be um, another turn? And finally, and not to answer for too long, I think the turn towards the Anthropocene is a way to get at um, a, a post-colonial approach to think about labor and the impact of the environment and the materials and where things are coming from. When I studied the history of shellcraft to see how Europeans were seeing these polished Nautilus shells and polished things and just, they call them naturalia. <laughs> By no means, this was, someone had to get in a champan, a, a little boat, weigh themselves down to the bottom of the ocean in the Manar, bring them up, do this all day, leave them on the beach to let the shell, the organic material rot, boil them in salt water brine, remove the exterior, and then polish them with a high degree of skill. And then if they're doing things like cutting them into little pieces to make mosaics or to put them in these lacquered pieces of furniture, this is not naturalia. This is a purposive uh, effacement of the labor, ecology, and resources that are being um, that are not being unvalued because they're worth a lot of money, but are purposefully going unnamed and purposely being unreported um, uh, because it doesn't fit a, a convenient narrative or history. And that's something that historians and art historians in particular. Uh, at least in my field, have become very aware of and, and are changing a lot of. And that's part of the reason that I'm here with the Fulbright program is to look at questions of exactly that, to look at um, artisanal epistemology, right? The special skills that artists have, even if they're not artists with a capital A, even if it's not Raphael or Durer or Michelangelo, that these objects still represent um, an uh, a vital part of the world's visual and material culture and history, and in some cases uh, reflect uh, the skill and artisanship uh, of equal genius, even if, even if we don't have the names. Why does that matter? We can take one more question. I can't hear you. Please use the mic. Actually, there is an answer to this question. Um, so goldsmiths, when they, uh, when they first were making treaties uh, with guilds, 
with Alfonso de Albuquerque after his arrival in 1515, insisted on being called the Veronical Cast, um, despite the fact that even period sources from the time say that they are not from that cast. Um, so, uh, so, and also the writing on that image is in Portuguese from a later time period than the image itself. Um, so, despite the fact that that says Brahmin Goldsmith, it is likely, and I, it escapes my mind, um, the, the, um, the, the caste and community that has, was typically assigned to Goldsmiths, but um, it, it, uh, it, you are absolutely right that there are some visual incongruities within that image. We, we have, well, um, so Jeremiah Losty uh, from the British uh, Museum has identified it as, as a, probably uh, a, 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 the, the, the dress of the time was different depending on, uh, you know, different, different casts and different things and has identified it as such. But we do have two records of um, uh, not, uh, not, um, uh, Muslim goldsmiths, but Muslim, uh, carpenters working both early on and in the, in the 1550s and some of the problems, um, that came, um, because as, as you know, uh, they were immediately told to all be expelled but that just didn't happen. <laughs> uh, and actually, my husband, would, my husband is also an art historian, and he works on the relationship between, um, he just published a book on art and ecology in, in the Islamic world, and he works on uh, the relationship between Europe and the Islamic land. So if you give me your contact information, I bet he can give you a better answer to that question than I can. <laughs> um, but, but yes, there, there are some visual inconsistencies in even those images. And we know that the handwriting um, was uh, different. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. In fact, I was going with David uh, to these places to photograph this book. Uh, the whole idea of this is, you know, the kind of art we have. Uh, I think it needs, needs to have a more reach out. That's all. And today, I think we have done that. So thank you very much, Dr. Kellywood. I'd like to thank Father Tony uh, for, you know, getting this set up for this event and for moderating it. Thank you, Father Tony. I'd like to thank uh, Scholastic Airebo, our Jesuit here, uh, for live streaming today. And also, for those who have not viewed this event, now they can see it on YouTube. I'd like to thank uh, our Lipper sons and sons for, for the sound. I'd like to thank the staff of XCHR. And lastly, all of you friends, Thank you very much for being present here. 21st October 2023 at 5.30 p.m. We are going to launch this book officially, The Jesuits, Goa and the Arts. Please spread this word and I would like to see you there. It's a great event. Uh, it's been a two-year journey for all of us, you know, this work with Tony and Rhino being the editors and David, you know, his masterpiece, I would say, in this regard. And uh, I just being only the company here. I would say that way. Please, I'll be very happy to see you on the 21st of October. A word to your friends. The book is still on pre-sale uh, till October 17th. Like I mentioned, the price is 3200 for a copy or two. 2800 for three or four copies. If you're going to buy five and more, it's 2400 So the sale is on till 17th. Don't miss this copy. Thank you and have a good night.